Hi, this is Anthony Parent of IRS Medic, and joining me today on a special update of some important expats issues going on around in Canada, in France, and around the globe is John Richardson of Canadian uh, Citizenship Solutions CA and our friend Keith Redman of uh, U.S. Expatriates Abroad 2.0. You can find his group on Facebook. Good day to you, gentlemen. And John, I want to start with you. We have a uh, we have a FATCA lawsuit going on in Canada. How are we doing with that? Well, we're doing very well, uh, and we're doing very badly. I guess it was a Dickens who wrote the best of times and the worst of times. Um, so the good news is that uh, we did get a decision. Uh, the bad news is we didn't get the decision that we wanted. Uh, the reason I say it's good news is that we got a decision is because it opens the door for an appeal and keeping the thing moving. And by all rights, this really does need to go to the uh, Supreme Court of Canada. Um, it is currently sort of uh, being digested uh, by our lawyers uh, who will make the ultimate decision on the appeal. I think that we do need to move forward with it because the uh, decision itself, uh, Justice McTavish, was very, very troubling. It basically, in my view, leaves it open for any country uh, to claim Canadian citizens and subject them to uh, laws basically uh, extraterritorially. So, for example, uh, if I understand Justice McTavish's decision, there would be no problem uh, for the government of China to take the position that anybody born in China was a citizen of China, therefore subject to taxation by China, and uh, the government of Canada would have no problem at all in agreeing, at least constitutionally, with the government of China to assist them with uh, information exchange with a view to enforcing that. Uh, or that's a good way to think about it. I mean, that's kind of how serious it is. And I think, you know, maybe the problem is, is that um, people look at the United States a little bit, you know, too friendly. Um, <laughs> the IRS doesn't really do a lot of nice things, but when you do put it in that context of imagining it, China doing the same thing, I think it gets a little bit scarier. So. What are the next steps and what is, what's the timing on there? And, and is, what's the layer of appeals that we have to go through uh, in order to get up to the, the, the Supreme Court of Canada? Right. So the sequence in courts would be, uh, so this, this was a decision of the, uh, the uh, trial division of the Federal Court of Canada. So the next step would be the Federal Court of Appeal. Uh, and from there, uh, one would have to get lead to the uh, Supreme Court of Canada. I would imagine that getting lead to the Supreme Court of Canada would probably happen uh, because the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of Canada is basically public importance. And now that uh, the, the Federal Court Trial Division Justice McTavish has essentially made the decision that any country can define anybody it wants as its citizens and claim them for the purposes of extraterritorial laws, I would say that that is an issue of, you know, some public importance in Canada. Uh, so I would think that, uh, assuming it gets through to the appellate level, that getting the Supreme Court of Canada should not be a problem. The issue, it seems to me, and this is a decision that at least initially would be made by our lawyers, would be what would be the grounds of appeal, to get the thing into the Federal Court of Appeal. Um, if you read the decision, it's uh, interesting. Uh, you know, it's 140 pages. The first 70 pages have to do with procedural and jurisdictional issues, basically. And uh, what I found interesting about the decision was that, uh, you know, as well as basically saying that situations like this do not attract constitutional protections be they things that are analogous to equal protection or unlawful search and seizure, uh, the judge actually incorporated the threats of U.S. sanction into the decision. And one significant paragraph for those listening, I think it's paragraph 349, uh, basically says that uh, when considering the possible impact uh, on Canada by way of U.S. sanction, uh, and if we compare that to, uh, you know, any right to not have your information disclosed to the IRS, the fact that Canada can be sanctioned is a significant consideration considering the extent of the individual right. And that may be a possible ground for appeal. Um, 
I had never understood the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms to be for the purpose of protecting the government of Canada. I had always understood the Charter of Rights to be protecting individual Canadians from the government of Canada. So this is, a, you know, this is definitely a, a new a new twist on the meaning of constitutional rights. <laughs> you have a way with words, John. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, you, okay, so what's the timing you think that it would get to the Federal uh, Court of Appeals um, and then the timing to get to yeah. the as I understand, as I understand, we have until the 30th of September to make the decision on the appeal. Uh, but I'm just uh, repeating what I've heard from the, uh, you know, the lawyers and that. Um, you know, this could be, I don't know how long. Then there's, of course, uh, you know, you can look it up yourself, the rules of the Federal Court of Appeal. It could probably be another year at least before this was heard. Uh, this, this, I think, will be going on for an awful long time. And if I can just make a pitch here for anybody who's listening, this will require funding, okay? Uh, litigation is expensive as can be. And uh, obviously, we are going to be asking, uh, you know, for funding on this. So please dig, dig deep, okay? And understand the absolute importance of this, both to individual Canadian citizens, and quite frankly, to the sovereignty of Canada and every other country. And I believe that there is no country that is safe as long as the United States continues this nonsense of trying to impose worldwide taxation on people who live in other countries. It's simply unbelievable. It's impossible to really administer it, and I agree. Um, and I think that's why, you know, when you look at this litigation and, and it's, you know, it's, it's wonderful, you know, that, that we're fighting, but really the better solution comes from Washington, D.C., if we can be united. Um, and hopefully maybe after 2020, we could start seeing some positive um, after the, the, the next uh, Congress, we hopefully we could get some positive action. Now, yeah, Keith, you know what, I, what I think yeah. might be, uh, just before we get in this, I think what might be an interesting idea, instead of all countries entering into intergovernmental agreements with the United States, the better solution might be for all countries to enter into a bilateral agreement of them, among themselves specifically to refuse to enter in the IGA with the United States. I think that would be a better way to view this. That would definitely stop it. That would, if, if every country was united against the United States, I think that would stop a lot of this nonsense. Uh, absolutely. Uh, now, Keith, we have some news uh, from uh, from France. Uh, we have uh, some fact a lawsuit going on there, and then some other news that occurred. So, why don't you just uh, fill in us fill us in what's going on? Sure. Um, well, with the fact a lawsuit in France, the words that John used in explaining what occurred in the fact a lawsuit in Canada are not that un. Um, they're 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 quite similar, even though the foundation of the lawsuit is a bit different. There was a two-pronged aspect to the lawsuit in France that the Association of Accidental Americans brought to the Conseil d'État, which is the equivalent of the U.S. Supreme Court. So I'll just call it the French Supreme Court. And they looked at privacy rights and discrimination as it, as it pertains to French law. And what the uh, French Supreme Court ruled was that they ruled against the Association of Accidental Americans they stated that the, there is no discrimination and that there is no standing as it pertains to privacy rights because this is a legitimate agreement with the United States. In, the, in addition to that, they also stated what much to all of our surprise is that the U.S. is doing its job in reciprocating with France and transmitting data to the French tax authorities on French residents in the United States, that the U.S. is fulfilling its obligation in re on reciprocation, which is not the case, okay? Absolutely. So it was a disappointment, certainly, because the what one gleans from that is that U.S. citizenship takes precedence over French citizenship in France. And so, as you can imagine, everyone involved is quite appalled with that. And as it pertains to French privacy rights, I don't know if the audience—I don't know if the audience realizes this—but last year there was a law that was enacted in the EU called the General 
data protection regulation. And just humor me for a second, because I, there's a reason why I'm going to give the definition of this. This was a law that was enacted in the EU, and the GDPR is a regulation in EU law on data protection and privacy for all individuals of the European Union and the European Economic Area. It also addresses the transfer of personal data outside the EU and the EEA areas. So we have a bit of a uh, contradiction here. Yeah. So what is going to happen is that the Association of Accidental Americans, uh, Fabian Laagra, who is a man on fire, who heads this association, is going to be taking this to the European Commission. That's the next step before it gets to the European Court of Justice. And then subsequently, it will go to the European Court of Justice, and it will be appealed there. So that means whatever um, uh, decision is rendered with the European Court of Justice will not just be for France, but it will be for the entire European Union. Oh, wow. Okay. So as you can imagine, um, Yes, this is bad news, but I'm always a cockeyed optimist that this can be good news moving forward. So that does not mean that all is lost in France because the Association of Accidental Americans are working very hard, Fabien in particular, with the French government to work with the United States on addressing this issue. That still, that pushback is still going to occur there. So uh, we're just going to have to see what happens, but there's a little bit of a timing issue or a deadline that is going to be quite interesting because by December 31st, there are about 40,000 accounts in France which could will be recalcitrant accounts, meaning that these individuals, accidental Americans, they do not have a social security number because they have no link with the United States. And what has been mandated is that these accounts will be closed if a Social Security number is not provided. But where there's going to be a problem is, is that it mandates in French law that a French citizen or legal resident in France has the right to a bank account. They cannot be denied a bank account, a basic bank account. So you can see right there the contradiction that's going to be that's set up right now. Now, mind you, this is 40,000 accounts just in France, but we're also talking in the larger view, all the other countries who have the FACTA IGA, the Intergovernmental Agreement, what's going to happen with their tens of thousands of accounts? This is going to be a major issue moving forward. Yeah, I would say so if, if, all is if, not lost. All is not lost because we can. it's going to be taken to the EU level now. Well, yeah, I mean, if accounts are being forty thousand accounts are being closed in, in France, um, just sort of spitballing what we're talking about in closing in, in total of Europe, uh, I would estimate probably about you know somewhere between two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand accounts in Europe. Uh, yeah, it's that, about three hundred yeah. to four hundred thousand accounts. Yeah, and then you know elsewhere around the world, who knows? I mean, it's really really crazy. And here you have the law of the United States trumping the sovereign law of the land, which I guess, I guess it's not the law of the land. I guess it's the United States calls all the shots, apparently. It'd be interesting if these countries decided to kind of be a country. That'd be kind of good. Now, would you guys, now this is what I want to talk about next. Um, what do you guys advise? And I'll start with you, John. Do you think if somebody, an accidental American, someone who's not in the system, um, should they go and get a social security number um, provide that to, to provide that to their bank so their account isn't closed. What would you recommend? Yeah, you know this is a very tough question. You know, it's really you know which of a number of bad options do you want to take? Um, my instinct is that they should not go and get a social security number uh, because. Social security numbers are only available to a certain group of people, and their claim to having a social security number would be that they're a U.S. citizen. And my understanding is that a lot of these uh, act, these so-called accidentals, are people who do not regard themselves as U.S. citizens. So what they're really doing, in part, I think, is you know I've never understood them so much to be resisting tax obligations as I have understood them to be resisting the notion that the United States can forcibly impose citizenship on them. That's, that's where I think uh, they really are. 
So my feeling would be that they should not get a social security number at the moment. They should see, or if at all, they should see how this develops. Um, the, uh, you know, I think, I think that ultimately what this is going to come down to is, you know, whether the, whether these countries are going to allow the United States to reach out and literally, you know, deem anybody it wants to be a U.S. citizen. One of the problems with the IGA, and I want to focus on this for a second, which I think is actually the most significant and important aspect of it, which didn't seem to make its way into the Canada fat velocity thing. But if you look at the IGA, all right, it very, very clearly allows the United States to define anybody it wants as a U.S. citizen, anybody it wants, because, uh, you know, they're bound by sort by the definitions in the Internal Revenue Code. And I think that that is the singularly most outrageous part of this thing, because these countries, not only are they agreeing to FACA, which is bad enough, but they are equally and most importantly agreeing that the United States can define any single resident, any single resident in that country, whether it's France, Canada, wherever, as a U.S. citizen. So what the courts in Canada and France have just done, in my view, is they have effectively stripped dual Canadian and French citizens of their Canadian or French citizenship. All right, that's what they've done. They've agreed that these, that these are U.S. citizens primarily, or, you know, functionally U.S. citizens only. And U.S. citizenship does not mean the same as citizenship in other countries. U.S. citizenship is a property interest in the individual, more than anything. And ultimately, I think that, you know, this is going to come down to not a taxation showdown, but a citizenship showdown. What does citizenship mean? And I would say it's, I mean, we have countries sort of just abdicating one of their primary functions. Just like, yeah, we're not just, we're not going to get into what it means to be a citizen. Whatever the United States says, I guess, is what it goes. They're the law of the land. I mean, that's essentially what they're saying. Um, that's, that That's exactly right. And not only are they handing over the ones that meet the criteria for U.S. citizenship today, but in the future, as long as the IGA goes on. Seven or eight years ago, I made the prediction when people laughed at me, and I'm going to make it again because okay. I think I'm right. If this goes on indefinitely, sooner or later, there's nothing stopping the United States to simply define everybody in the world a U.S. citizen for tax purposes. No problem. Why wouldn't they if every right. country is going to agree to this? Oh. Then they will magnanimously move to residence-based taxation, amend the Internal Revenue Code to simply say all U.S. citizens are subject presumptively to worldwide taxation except those who live in the United States. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Um, and now, Keith, what, what would you recommend? Would you recommend someone getting a Social Security number here in this situation, an accidental American, someone who's not in the system already, would you think that well, they should? Well, let me tell you what has historically been happening over the past few years in regards to accidental Americans. Historically, what has been occurring with accidental Americans is a couple of things. One, they've been putting off their banks the best they can of not providing this information and hoping that the situation will just go away. Okay, that's point one. Point two is they've been putting off the banks and until the bank forces them to give them any information that they need because they've been identified as a U.S. person. Some people have done, an, have done a self-certification that they are not a U.S. person and they have outlined why they are not. Some banks have accepted that, other banks have not. Um, point number three is many accidental Americans have applied for a social security number and have received it for the sole purpose of giving it to their bank and so that they, we, they can keep their bank accounts open. Now, moving forward, it has been suggested to, uh, and I hear what John is saying, it has been suggested to can keep on doing that and to just get a Social Security number in order to satisfy the bank and just leave it at that. Now, at the end of the day, what will occur with that? 
I don't know. But from a because this is so illogical, I'm trying to put some logic to it. So from a logical standpoint, you have an accidental American, and I'll just use France as an example, with no U.S. ties, no assets in the U.S., no family in the U.S., nothing whatsoever, have never entered the U.S. tax system. They don't have any interest in the U.S. whatsoever. Now, they can move forward as it is right now with that type of situation because in France, and I received this information directly from the French tax authorities and Fabien Laagra from the Accidental Association of Accidental Americans has received this in writing that anyone in France who is a French citizen living in France is protected from the IRS by the French tax authorities, meaning they will not do the IRS bidding. With, with a few exceptions, drug trafficking, human trafficking, terrorist activities, money laundering, which the majority of these people don't fall into those categories. So there is a certain protection there. Now, my question to John, because this is a little bit of a discussion, is I respect what John's saying in regards to don't get the Social Security number and see what happens. But from a practicality standpoint, if we get toward the end of December and that accidental American is being threatened to have his or her account closed, should they at that point go ahead and tell the bank they're in the process of getting a social security number and to just hold off and to see what happens? What would be a practical solution with that situation? Because you have people, they, you know, you have to have a bank account. That's a given. So that's the big question that I kind of throw out on the table. You know what, Keith, and I, the way I would answer that is, um, you know, so you, you said, okay, well, if, if a French accidental American gets, gets a social security number, and then the IRS starts to, and then the IRS, now what can the IRS do? At that point, they, the would, question. they would have to begin some sort of examination. Um, there's really nothing. And to, how do they do that? Exactly. How, that's what, what do they examine? Hard. They're, right. That's very hard. They're going to get some doc. They can get some docu documents from FACA, but they're kind of not going to get enough. Um, and additionally, they also have to weigh the effort required to examine someone who's in France who might not have all that much. And it's actually very difficult. And this is where we talk about sort of the absurdity of trying to administer global taxation where you can't be global. Um, they certainly don't have the examiners to do this. They really don't. Um, you know, where the IRS has their focus is they sort of do a lot of armchair auditing. Hey, somebody filed a Form 3520A. Oh, here's an automatic penalty we can assess because there's a number wrong here or there. Or the IRS likes to assess the penalties when it's actually correctly filed, and that's something that's going on right now. So that's really where you see their focus. So where, where I would see it is if someone did get a Social Security number, what are you going to do, IRS? What are you going to do? And the answer is not a lot. If the IRS wants to come to France to examine someone, they actually have to seek permission. It's not something where they yes. can just show up. So there's a tremendous amount of protection. So I would say, yeah, it's not really the ideal thing. I really don't want someone to enter the system. I mean, I have to advise I have to advise full compliance with the law, but I don't see that much harm in it if it is done, and especially when it comes down to last resorts. Um, the right. now it, I hear I hear. I hear what John's saying in regards to not getting a social security number because one wild card thing in this whole situation, and I'll use France as an example, is what's going to happen at the end of the year? Is the French government going to change French law to say that everyone has the right to a bank account that's right now in French law except those people who are accidental Americans yeah. and they don't have a right to the, a French bank yeah. account? No, is that what's I'm... going to happen? Big question. Yeah. You know, look. Obviously, you know, we're just having a discussion. Nobody can know. Honestly. Absolutely. But, yeah. you know, as, as sort of an observer of this problem now for going on almost a decade, my sense of this is that the more steps people take towards compliance, the more this continues. And, you know, maybe maybe getting a Social Security number is benign. But again, getting a Social Security number on the basis of their, you know, on their entitlement to it as a U.S. citizen, their position is they're not U.S. citizens. In fact, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, the U.S. trying to enforce a law, you know, I think extraterritorially. My feeling is 
that the issue needs to be forced. I don't think they should get social security numbers. I think that basically they should take a go ahead and make my day, okay, approach with the banks. If France wants to make fools of themselves as a country and say that we're so afraid of the United States that we're not going to let 40, you know, these people have bank accounts, go ahead, let them do it. Let them do it. Uh, I think that it will uh, uh, make the situation more public. I think it will show the absurdity of it. And, I, you know, I mean, there's no right answer to this. But my gut is telling me they should not be going out and getting Social Security numbers because all they're doing is just continuing to play the game here. Uh, the other thing is this, that, you know, we haven't talked about renunciation. Um. Uh, I, mean, I was just going to bring that up, so that's good, John. I would agree that you can only renounce U.S. citizenship if you believe you have it. But, uh, look, I, I think that everybody has got to find a way to get out of this situation. And, you know, renunciation is available. Um, I think a, a number of people ought to be considering it. So let me ask you something, John, in regards to renunciation. If you take the average accidental American, wherever they may, France, wherever, what would be a better choice for them to do, to go and get a, a Social Security number to satisfy their bank or do nothing or go ahead and renounce their supposed alleged U.S. citizenship but just don't enter the U.S. tax system, which you can do? These seem to be the, the, the viable options. Well, the there's a fourth one, and that is to enter the U.S. tax system, become compliance, and then renounce. That's also an option. Well, that is true, depending on one situation, because one could enter the U.S. tax system and lose everything just to renounce, that, well, which very well, well could happen. Well, I mean, I think we need to be very, very careful here, because there are a number of people where I would advise just that. You know, to enter to enter the U.S. tax system, come into compliance, and then renounce. Uh, there are, oh, there I are agree. Number, Based on there are a number of people. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think we need to be careful. It's one thing to talk about options, but you know, ultimately, people are going to make the choices that best serve their interests. There are an awful lot of people where I think their best strategy actually is, even if they don't think they're American, to pretend they're American, if you will, because of a place of birth or whatever enter the tax system, and then renounce. Uh, I mean, this depends on a number of considerations, obviously, exit tax issues, et cetera. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, one does not have to uh, be tax compliant to renounce. They're completely different statutes. Uh, there are people where I think that's a reasonable choice. Uh, that said, uh, in the United States, the United States is about only about taxation. Everything in the United States is taxable, including the renunciation of citizenship, has tax consequences. And, you know, if people can avoid being covered expatriates, I think that's a very, very good idea. I mean, if they just renounce without dealing with the tax situation, they will be covered expatriates. And that may or may not uh, be a personal consequence to them. Um, you know, the, I don't know. The idea of just getting a Social Security number, you know, to satisfy this just does not sit well with me. But I think, John, you know, I think, John, your point is, you know, it's it's sort of time for a revolution, and we're all looking for everybody to go at the same point to say, hey, look, we're none of us are going to comply. You know, and unfortunately, the IRS is really good at, at uh, sort of singling out people and um, making us all sort of do things that we. Would probably I'm not saying people shouldn't comply. I'm saying the issue here is one of U.S. citizenship. Okay, it's not so much an issue of taxation. The point of these accidental Americans is that, you know, if they happen to be born in the United States, they're whisked out of the country, you know, at a very young age. They have nothing to do with the United States. I personally think that their claim they're not U.S. citizens for any purpose uh, is a reasonable claim. Uh, you know, that's a very different situation from... You know, people who grew up in the United States then moved to France or something. That's a different situation altogether. Uh, you know, there, there's, it's not like there's any, you know, one right answer here. Uh, I think that the people need right. to yeah. consider their own situations. And I would say for us, when, uh, when we're dealing with a prospective client, if it's somebody who does have a connection with the U.S., some assets, um, a chance that they'll move back to the U.S., uh, you know, we strongly advise to come into compliance. 
um, and stay in compliance. If they want to exit, fine. And I think the critical thing to understand, and we talked about this in a previous um, episode, is that you know you really got to match up your compliance correctly. You don't want to under comply. You also don't want to over comply. And you also have to watch out for a lot of the little mistakes the IRS is looking for. And it's something that, you know, it's really something that probably will be a little bit more extensive than you would assume it would be. Um, the IRS looks at you as far, um, you know, looks at, you know, just regular people as a far juicier target than they assume themselves to be. So that's really, you know, our advice is if, you know, if somebody's not in the system, I'll let someone else comment on that. If somebody's, if someone's not, or someone's not in the system and has no assets, no connections with America, I'll let someone else discuss that. Um, but if they do have that connection to the U.S., then that's really where um, these things can really um, have unintended consequences way down the road. And it's really something you really want to deal with now. But it might be the best thing. Oh, I, I agree with you totally. Yeah. I mean, to be very, very absolutely clear, for you know, for Anthony, for Keith, and for everybody listening to this. I think that there are a lot of people, you know, where their best option is to comply. Uh, you know, whether it's, you know, whether it's for renunciation or something else. I mean, uh, you know, or ongoing compliance, you know, depending on how their life is unfolding. They're, but Exactly, based know, on their profile. You know, but we are not here primarily, you know, we talk about the accidental American problem. You know, that is a subset of this of this rather large group of people. I think the point here is that there is no one right answer, okay? I mean, I think that people do should always do what they can to try to be, you know, within the parameters of the law, you know, clearly. Uh, but the but people's situations are different and the le- and the ramifications of being in compliance with the law or not are different for different people. Uh, I think there's a lot of the worst advice online is the one size fits all advice out there right you that's know, there's true this, there's oh, no yeah, everybody should comply. In, in general I, I do see where i do see where we're just about uh out of time so i will share your contact information uh uh in the co- uh, below so that people can reach out uh to john uh and both keith um you guys help out so many people uh around the world with these difficult issues um, and also, I want to just tell people to subscribe because we're going to be covering some more things that are coming up uh, with this whole fact of nonsense, with our quest for to get some true, uh, a really true fair tax system for Americans uh, everywhere they are. Um, so with that, this is Anthony Parent for IRS Medic. Thank you so much to John Richardson and Keith Redmond for joining me today. Thanks for watching.